Things for Francis appear to have taken a turn for the worst. On Monday, I told you that he was dealing with certain procedures that would leave him weak, and frankly, with limited time left. And I told you that he knew that, too, and was known that for a while, as evident by his recent flurry of activity appointing bishops, naming bishops to honorary positions, filling key posts to the coming synod on synods that will be a virtual Third Vatican Council, and, of course, all of this set against the backdrop of his increasingly contentious rhetoric leveled against meanie headed traditional Catholics who just don't want to get along with the program of making the Church promote the Gospel of Man instead of the Gospel of our Blessed Lord. But we now have word that Francis has extended his stay with his handlers indefinitely, which means things must have taken a turn for the worse. So let's take stock of what is going on because the story continues to develop and we are now left with the likes of Tobin, Supich, Perilin, and men very much like them in charge of the church, even if Francis is with, may be with us for a few years yet to come. So let's dive in. But before we go further, I have bonus material for you today, but it's not on YouTube. It's on the podcast-only pot side, which can be found in an embedded player on my sources blog at returntotradition.org. That's the name of this channel with a .org at the end. Or on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Podbean, or any of the major podcasting platforms. All you have to do is search for Return to Tradition over there. The bonus material is just way too hot for this place, and it covers the recent, shall we say, James Martin Choir just laying out what they really want to do. This caused a major storm online over the weekend, and one of the things that I originally did when I started this channel was to go over that kind of story here, but I can't do that anymore. So it's over on the audio-only side of things. A link to the pinned is in the pinned comment below if you just want to check it out in today's show notes without having a podcasting player. Anyway, let's get back to the story. Francis's announcement that he is extending his stay under the watchful supervision of his expert handlers makes it time to really look at something, who the church is in the hands of. Certain men run the church now, with his full blessing, who previously would only be restrained by his direct influence and his extremely skillful presentation of heterodoxy filtered through his strange affability. It should go without saying that Paca Papa Francis is much more likable than the likes of Cardinals Tobin or Wilton Gregory or Perelin or any of the other important figures in the church either in the Roman hierarchy or in America or both. At least Francis is more likable if you're not paying attention to what he is actually doing most of the time and what the fruits of his work actually are and an unholy alliance with the beast and all the would-be Caesars of the world that leaves the institutions of the church promoting a false gospel of the material instead of the spiritual. But this is functionally who the church is in the hands of now, men unworthy for the job. And this will be made all the more obvious as Francis is stuck away from the Vatican, unable to coalesce actions around him most of the time and to do what he does best, make it look like what he is doing is Catholic to enough of the faithful that even many otherwise decent and faithful people are taken in by what he is doing. Archbishop Vigano recently riffed on this in an interview over at John Henry Weston's website, and he spoke of these men who functionally run the church as being unfit to even say the mass, given their position on what I call the James Martin issue, which so many of the men who surround Francis and get promoted by him support, that it's clear that the hierarchy of the church has been taken by those who have a love and an admiration of a certain sin that cries out to heaven, a sin that the voices of the world and its rulers all seem to love and admire and promote themselves rather strangely. Of this, Vigano says, quote, It is a self-destroying gesture in which the leaders of the church surrender unconditionally to the antichristic ideology of the Leviathan and hand over the entire flock of Christ as a captive to the enemy, abdicating their role as pastors and showing themselves for who they really are, mercenaries and betrayers, he said. It is, said Archbishop Vigano, outrageous towards God, discreditable for the honorable honor of the church, matter of grave impropriety for the faithful, and a desolating abandonment for priests and confessors that a voice can be given to a Jesuit, Father James Martin, who bases his personal success not on a proper pastoral action seeking the conversions of individuals with respect to morality, but on the illusory promise of some change in Catholic doctrine that would legitimize people's sinful behavior, end quote. And make no mistake, Francis himself embraced James Martin's entire program in writing in a personal note that we know for a fact Francis knew Martin would publish. I mean, the logic dictates that he would publish it since he runs one of the biggest Catholic magazines in North America. But there is a master push to all of this, at least in the eyes of the typical lay Catholic. Many Catholics believe that the Church must get with the times, that Latin is a dead language and thus must be abandoned, that the traditional liturgy is stuffy and old and must be abandoned that the world has moved on from what the church professes to teach to be true about how life is to be lived, 
and thus must be abandoned. I see it in, in the comments here all the time, and I see it in social media posts from major Catholic organizations. This is a widespread view of the church that much of the laity possesses, that the church must conform to what the world wants in all things. This view is explained by one anonymous writer over at Marco Tosati's site recently in an article. Now, Tosati is an Italian journalist who has deep ties to the Roman Curia and often breaks stories that no one else reports. And the piece he published reminds us of the existence of Eugenio Scalfari, a friend of Francis's who openly says that he does not believe, well, anything really about God, that he professes no credo. Francis has used him at least 21 times since 2013 to say some outlandish things that only a few times the Vatican has had to backpedal on. This piece I reference here explains the worldview of a Scalfari and how it lines up pretty much perfectly with the worldview of the typical member of the laity, and how in the eyes of all too many Catholics, Francis isn't the Pope of St. Francis of Assisi's prophecy about the destroyer Pope, but is instead the great preserver because he gets along with the forces of the world so well. Quote, Instead, Scalfari seems to want to affirm between the lines that finally the Enlightenment credo triumphs, which purifies customs twisted by religious morality, directing them to as many morals as there are passions, values that must coexist and not oppose each other in the name of a supposed unity. Scalfari has noticed that the modern world, in continuous transformation, is deteriorating the religious sense as a relationship with the divine, with consequences on the morality that inspires rules of life. But note that the least concerned with this change are Catholics, and here he gives us an explanation that is somewhat ambiguous and complex to understand. It suggests that earlier the Christian religion referred to a higher being, while today it is diverted to discussions on personal choices, James Martin-related topics, food, etc., thus making the divine disappear and religiosity collapse as 500 years ago, thanks to the schisms, a consequence of the world that was changing economically and culturally. In fact, in short, Francis saves us because he has understood modernity. He doesn't expressly say so, of course, but you can guess it. Scalfari does not seem to understand, however, that this does not facilitate his possible conversion before his own time runs out. End quote. The translation algorithm I used for that was pretty rough, so I had to clean it up to have it make any sense at all, but you get the idea. Francis preserves the church in our turbulent times of declining belief because he makes the church promote a material gospel, instead of all that silly divine stuff. Given that only one in three Catholics believe in the real presence of our Lord in the sacrament of the altar, I think this analysis of Scalfari is on point. Though if that is what Scalfari believes about Francis, then it misses a key point. Without the acceptance of the divine, without the faith, then the church is just an institutional husk, not doing anything really that we can be called Catholic. A works-based doctrine is no more Catholic than Calvin's idea of predestination, or Luther's command to sin joyfully, or Henry VIII's voracious appetites. It's just another false gospel, a pernicious error that needs to be corrected, even if most Catholics accepted that pernicious error as true because the man they see as Pope pushes it. In the Summa Theologia, St. Thomas Aquinas tells us, quote, Fraternal correction is likewise an act of charity, since through it we repel our brother's evil, namely sin. It does not puff ourselves up to think that we can correct a prelate, because again, according to St. Thomas, quote, when a man reproves his prelate charitably, it does not follow that he thinks himself any better, but merely that he offers his help to one who, being the higher position among you, is therefore in greater danger, as Augustine observes. End quote. It's an act of charity, of mercy, to even stridently say, Francis, please stop for the good of your own soul and for the good of Christ's church. Even if you know that they won't listen, we have a duty to correct error when we see it. That is sadly a recurring thing in our time, the need to correct error, and this is we're talking about such a widespread one here that it often seems, feels like that we are already the remnant of Catholic prophecy, of what we were told in sacred scripture would be the reality in the end days. And we have been assured that when Francis returns to work, he'll never be the same. Now, for the older members of this audience, you'll probably be reminded of John Paul II's final years, where he was unable to really exert any real influence over all the St. Gallen types who surrounded him. Imagine that scenario now, only now it will be by people who share his vision for the role of the church in the world, or maybe think it doesn't go far enough, and they lack any semblance of self-restraint or subtlety. At least that is one scenario. Another is that he might bounce right back and continue to globetrot and promote his materialistic gospel, just as a slower physical speed. But either way, the time may be drawing short for him, like I said on Monday, and we need to be prepared for a time of greater turbulence in the church. That's coming and I doubt that the next conclave is going to bring us anyone better on the throat of Peter, as I've gone over many, many times in the past. Now, now that's my thought for the day. Now, what do you think about this? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. 
Is Francis running at high speed right now to continue appointing his men despite his own state, or is this just nothing to pay attention to? Is this just business as usual? Let me know what you think, and also make sure to like, subscribe, and uh, hit the bell. It does help. As always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.